obeisances and do not fit out. My spiritual master, Om Vishnu Bharat, the Shloka Sikhsma Bhakti Pratyana, Keshav Goswami Maharaj, and my Siksha Guru, Nitya Lila Pravishta Om Vishnu Bharat, Ashwata Sishma Bhakti Vedanta Swami Maharaj. In ancient time, about 5,000 years before, all the saintly persons, realized souls, rishis and muni were guided in Namishara. There were very worry that the Iron Age Kaljuga is coming. Everything will be upset. Men they will give up their religion, ladies also. Always divorce, so many problems will come. So then they are thinking, what to do? In the same time, Sudh Goswami, the disciple of Subhadeva Sila Subhadeva Goswami, he came there and then very politely, humbly, they asked a question. Now irony is coming, so many problems will arise. If anyone will want to do bhajan, they cannot do. So many ethics will be in that time. So, we ask you, you are very qualified and learned person. You should say how our soul will be happy. There might be no question that I will be happy, my body will be happy. The question was, really in this body we are so, body is mortal. Today, tomorrow, day after tomorrow it will be old and it will give up this body. So, you should tell us how soul will be happy forever. And then Shruti Goswami became very happy and then began to answer the question. First of all, he did pranam to his Gurudev, Srinar Sukhadev Goswami, Yang Prabhajanta Manupeta Mapeta Kittyam Dvaipayano Viraka Tarajuhavo Putreti Tanmayatya Karvo Vine Tam Sarvabhuta Vidayam Munima And then he, after doing Pradam, he told, Really, the transcendental religion of all universe, all the light beings, to do bhajan of Krishna. And that bhajan will be selfless, only to praise Supreme Lord Krishna. In other ways, it has been told by Sri Rupa Goswami, Anna Vilasita Sunyam Gyan Karmadhyana Vritam Anukillena Krishna Anushilanam Bhakti Rutthama.
So Anyal be lost of Sindhyam, Dhyana Karmari Anavitam. If we reflect day after day yeah, what we are doing, how we are progressing, then we can use always this definition. And we will see, if we are realistic, that I'm far from pure devotional service, but by the mercy of Sri Guru, He's so kind to me, He's so merciful. And Vaishnavas, they are so kind. They always accept me whether I'm full of faults, yeah? I do so many things wrong. So by their mercy, every day I see a little progress. Still so far to go, yeah? but by their mercy. So let me always stay in their company and try to somehow or other assist them. Then one day I will be able to really perfectly engage in Uttama Bhakti. Your devotion is always one check out the third place that people see. So, without pure bhakti, anyone cannot be happy. So, will not be happy. Those who don't worship, do bhakti of Krishna, they cannot be happy at any time. Like a business, some persons, they do bhakti to Krishna and ask something. That is called Anna Vilas. So don't want anything against this bhakti. Then surely, one day, in one life, two life, you must be happy. If anyone is chanting, remembering, worshipping Krishna, his soul must be happy. And then telling this, Sukh Goswami began to tell about the glory of Guru. And he gave an example of Nardarishi and Bhyas Dev, who, who is the incarnation of Krishna, Supreme Lord. You can. Bhagavatam is also giving many, many examples of how there were so many personalities, very, very great personalities, who attained the highest perfection of life by practicing this imperishable, eternal path of Bhakti Yoga. So, in the very beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam, there is a narration wherein uh, the author of the Srimad Bhagavatam who is named Sri Krishna Dvaipayana Veda Vyas. Some, just in short, 
Srila Vyas Dev. Tomorrow is the Vyas Puja Day, in which the representative of Srila Vyasadeva, the author of the Vedic literature, is, is honored. And this festival is the Vyas Puja festival of our beloved Gurudev, Srila Bhaktivedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. So, we will hear so much about Srila Vyasadeva and the meaning of his name tomorrow. So, and that's at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. So, <clears throat> Srila Vyasadeva, he had compiled the Vedic literatures. He actually compiled the four Vedas, Rig, Sama, Yajur, and Atarva Veda. He divided the one original Veda into these four. And then he also wrote the Upanishads, the philosophical portions of the Vedas. He also then wrote the Puranas, 18 Puranas, <clears throat> and gave so many examples of how the living beings within this world can go on the spiritual pathway to attain spiritual perfection in their lives. But as he saw that the Kali Yuga, this current age of quarrel and hypocrisy was approaching, this was about 5,000 years ago, he saw that in this age of Kali, the people would have very short lives, they would be very misguided by so many different philosophical misconceptions and their intelligence and many other qualities would be greatly reduced in the Kali Yuga. So Srila Vyasadeva, then he compiled the great scripture known as the Mahabharata. So in the Mahabharata, he also included uh, great histories of great kingly dynasties on our planet. Actually, this book, Mahabharata, is well known all throughout the world, and in this part of the world as well. Uh, and these histories describe the dynasties that were existing on our planet 5,000 years ago. But there is also so much spiritual, philosophical instruction given there. So, Srila Vyasadeva completed these uh, Vedic scriptures, and he was living in the Himalayan mountains, uh, in Badrika Ashram, Samya Pras. And in that very beautiful place, surrounded by beautiful mountains and forests and sacred river, Saraswati was flowing there. So Srila Vyasadeva one day was sitting there and contemplating what he had accomplished in writing all of these Vedic literatures. But he felt within himself that he was not satisfied. Huh? He then began to contemplate the reason for this, that I have compiled all these Vedic literatures. I have prescribed the method by which the living beings within this world can get free from this endless cycle of birth and death. And I have described uh, how they can achieve the benefits within this world called the Chaturvar, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha, uh, the religiosity, economic development, uh, satisfaction of the senses, and ultimately moksha, liberation. But Srila Vyasadeva, in contemplating, he was wondering, why am I not satisfied? I should be satisfied, because I've accomplished this great task. So, he could not detect the actual cause of his dilemma. And then at that time, the very, very great and powerful sage named Sri Narada Rishi, Narada Muni, who is the guru of Sri Vyasadeva, he now uh, appeared coming down from the sky region uh, and he was accompanied by his musical instrument, the Veena. Throughout all the Vedas, Srila Narada Muni is very well known because he is the guru of many, many great saintly persons. So he is also the guru of Srila Veda Vyas himself. So now, when Narada Rishi came down into his ashram, Srila Vyasadeva was so overjoyed to see his guru, and he began to uh, pay his pranams to his guru, provide him a, a, a very uh, wonderful sitting place there. And at that time, Sri Narada Rishi was sitting and he, was, he had a smile on his face. 
And he said to his disciple, Sri Veda Vyas, Oh, my dear Prabhu, are you satisfied by identifying this temporary body with the eternal soul? In other words, what Narada Rishi was doing was he was beginning to point out that Srila Veda Vyas had made a mistake in the way in which he had compiled the Vedic literatures from the viewpoint that he emphasized the material accomplishments of the temporary physical world and the material bodies within this world. And he did not emphasize enough the transcendental reality. So then, Narada Muni, because he is Guru, and Guru is a perfected living being who knows all knowledge perfectly. If someone is actually Guru, they have to have full, perfect comprehension of all spiritual truth and wisdom. So even though Veda Vyas was such an exalted personality, still he was not able to quite determine the cause of his dissatisfaction. Now Narada Rishi was beginning to point that out to him. And then he began to question Veda Vyas that, oh, you have compiled all these literatures, but have you properly glorified uh, the Supreme Absolute Truth who has descended into this world and performed miraculous superhuman activities in the form of his divine incarnations? And have you especially glorified his incarnations in the form of Sri Krishna when he appeared in Vrindavan 5,000 years ago? Uh, and at that time he sported as if he was a human being of this world, but he performed such sweet transcendental pastimes. Although he is the supreme Bhagavan, controller, and absolute personality of the entire creation. And have you especially pointed out how this supremely powerful personality of Godhead comes into this world and he becomes the little son of his mother and out of affection his mother uh, binds him with ropes uh, and sometimes even chastises him. Uh, have you shown this in your writings? And have you shown how his friends will play with him like two friends are playing with one another and they'll climb on his shoulders thinking that he's equal to them although he's the supreme Bhagavan? And have you described how his dearly beloved the sweethearts, the Brajagopis, uh, how they will also sometimes chastise him? Oh, you have not described in this way the extent, the full extent of the glories of the pastimes, the leelas, the transcendental activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead who descends into this world to exhibit these pastimes for the benefit of all the fallen souls. So this is the reason for your dissatisfaction. And when Srila Vyasadeva heard this pointed out by Sri Narada Rishi, oh, now he began to understand, yes, yes, actually this is a fact. I have not specifically pointed this out. And at that time, Sri Narada Rishi began to explain that only by this glorification and by hearing the transcendental activities of the Supreme Lord uh, from the lips of realized souls can this realization come to the conditioned souls of this world and they can overcome this hurdle of birth, death, disease, and old age, and they can obtain their eternal relationship with the Supreme Lord in the spiritual realm, only by this process. And then, Sri Narada Rishi mentioned to Vyasadeva that I myself am a living example of this, huh? because when I was a, in my previous life, before this life, I was born as the son of an ordinary lady who was a maid servant and a cleaner uh, in an ashram. And when I was a little boy at that time living there, now uh, I had a very, very great opportunity in my life. You see, Sri Guru, he will sometimes tell to his disciples examples of his own life. Because Sri Guru comes into this world to show us the pathway that we can follow in our own lives to attain perfection. 
So when he sees that there is a sincere disciple, sometimes he may reveal some truths about his own life or past life. So Narada Rishi was beginning to tell the story to Srila Vyasadeva. And Srila Vyasadeva was very anxious to hear this story from Sri Narada Muni. So Narada Rishi explained that in my previous life, when I was a very young boy, and I was a very simple birth, nothing elevated in society, I was only the son of an ordinary cleaning lady. And my mother was so affectionate to me because I was all that she had in this world. So she used to bind me with so much affection. And during my childhood, when I was about five years old, I was staying in an ashram with my mother. And there were four very great uh, spiritual personalities, rishis, great saints, who came there to reside in that very place during the four months of the rainy season. Uh, and they stayed there all during that time. And I began to associate with them because they would sit together and they would discuss these wonderful activities, transcendental topics of the Supreme Lord, Adhoksaja, uh, who is in the transcendental realm, Bhagavan Sri Krishna. And I used to sit and associate with them and I used to hear these divine topics with such attraction. And as I associated with them more and more, my attraction grew more and more and more. Just by hearing from them, my heart started to become purified. And these sages, they saw that I was not like other young boys, always anxious to play frivolously and waste my time, but I was very calm and very quiet and very controlled. So these sages became very affectionate towards me. And now they began to bless me with their mercy. They bestowed their mercy upon me. And in the course of my association with them, they gave me the opportunity one day, by their permission, to take the remnants of their food after they had eaten. And this transcendental sub, uh, substance, uh, this uchistale pan, this wonderful food that has been touched by the lips of such exalted personalities. It has a transcendentally powerful effect. And when I ate these few remnants, immediately I began to feel purified from all the lower modes of nature, which cause one to become lusty and angry and greedy within this world. And my heart became purified, and now their divine personalities became so attractive to me. And in this way, I passed my time in their association. After the four months of the rainy season was finished, uh, now these four sages, they left that place. And I was left in the hands of my mother, who was my only guardian within this world. But then one day, my mother, who went out into the nearby forest to collect some firewood, she was bitten by a poisonous snake, and she died. But when I heard this news, I began to understand by the instructions of the great sages that this was an arrangement of the Supreme Lord who controls everything. For my benefit, he had arranged this circumstance. And now, taking shelter of the Lord within my heart and taking the instructions of these divine sages, I left that place and I began to travel to the northern direction. And I traveled through so many forests and so many different places. And finally, I arrived at a very secluded place in a forest grove. And at that time, I sat down in that place remembering the instructions of these great sages who had taught me the process of bhakti yoga by which I can focus my full attention, my heart, mind, and soul uh, on the Lord who is residing within my heart. And now I sat and fully engaged all of my attention in this meditation. And at that time, my limbs became overwhelmed by divine ecstasy because this is a transformation process. When one reaches a stage of spiritual perfection, then divine spiritual ecstasies manifest within the body. And Narada Muni explained that this happened to me as I was performing this meditation. 
And then when I became so overwhelmed in this mood and tears were flowing from my eyes, at that very moment, the Supreme Lord Himself, Bhagavan, Sri Vishnu, He appeared on the lotus of my heart, and I had His darshan. And at that time, I became completely absorbed in His divine beauty, and I lost all consciousness of everything else. And when I was absorbed in the meditation upon His beautiful form, then in a few moments, now His form suddenly vanished. And at that moment, I felt like I had just lost the most valuable thing that I had ever gained in my whole life. And I felt great anxiety, and again, I sat down in the same process of meditation, attempting to again have this experience. And I tried, but it was not happening again. And now I felt so much deep, deep lamentation. But at that time, out of His compassion, the Supreme Lord Himself spoke to me. I heard His voice. And He told to me, my dear Narada, it is not possible for someone who has not fully purified himself by the process of bhakti yoga, who has not overcome all uh, contaminations of the heart, to actually have this experience of my having my darshan, seeing me directly. Only I have given you a special mercy, just to increase your desire to one day uh, again see me. So now during this life, you should spend your whole life hearing and chanting about me and you should purify your heart and then in the future again very soon you will be able to be united with me and then the voice who was speaking disappeared now Narada Muni fell to the ground with tears in his eyes and a deep deep mood of gratitude to the Supreme Lord who is so so merciful to the souls of this world and now Narada Rishi described to Vyas, at that time, as a young boy, I, I went traveling everywhere for my whole duration of my life, hearing and chanting and remembering the glories of Sri Krishna's name, form, qualities, and pastimes. And I spent my life in this way, and when my heart was completely purified of all material desires and contaminations and attachments, and I was fully attracted to the Supreme Lord, then my end of my life came. And in my next life, I appeared in this form of Narada, as you see now. And I was given a beautiful stringed instrument called Veena. And this was given to me by Bhagavan himself. And now I travel everywhere throughout the whole creation, constantly singing, chanting, and remembering the glories of Sri Krishna. So Narada Rishi, explained like this to Veda Vyas, and he gave him this instruction that you should absorb yourself uh, in this process of bhakti yoga, and then you should glorify Sri Krishna in his divine transcendental pastimes. And then at that time, Narada Rishi finished his instructions to Vyas, and he left that place into the airways. Now Sri Vyasadeva, with great uh, happiness, he sat and purified himself by taking water from the river Saraswati, and he sat in complete meditation of bhakti yoga. Bhakti yoga in manasi, samyak samiteya malay, apashya purusham purnam, maya chatad apashrayam. So now, Srila Vyasadeva, by the complete absorption in bhakti yoga, he was able to actually see to have the divine vision of the Apashya Purusham Purnam. That means the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the complete absolute truth. And he saw that absolute truth, Bhagavan Sri Krishna, with all of his energies accompanying him, both his transcendental spiritual energy and his Maya potency, the illusory potency of this world, in which all the jivas are covered by ignorance. Anarto Pasamam Sakshat Bhakti Yoga Marhok Sajay. And then at that time, he understood that all the anartas, the unwanted things that keep the living beings separate from the Lord within this world, they can be completely mitigated 
by this process of pure bhakti yoga. So in order to benedict all the living beings of this world with this pure transcendental divine message of the pastimes of Krishna, Srila Vyasa Dev, Chakre Samhita, Sattvata Samhitam, he composed this Srimad Bhagavatam that we are now going to have the opportunity to hear in so many different sections of the Bhagavatam from our Gurudev and all the speakers here. So our Gurudev, he has pointed out to us that this Srimad Bhagavatam, it is the highest and final literature of Srila Vyasa Dev. If anyone hears and chants and remembers the topics of this Srimad Bhagavatam, and they take shelter of the person Bhagavatam, that means the pure devotee who is fully living the message of Srimad Bhagavatam, and they serve these two manifestations of the Lord in book form and in the form of a pure devotee, then their hearts will become completely purified and they eventually will attain the same destination of Shri, as Sri Narada Rishi. So the lesson to learn from the story of Narada is that by the association of pure devotees, by pleasing them, by following their instructions, even if we come from any ordinary background of this world, by the pure process of bhakti yoga, we can attain the highest perfection in our life. So in this way, Srila Vyasadeva wrote the king of all Vedic Shastras, Srimad Bhagavatam. So we see Shrimad by Srimad Bhagavatam. Everywhere, glorification of only bhakti and bhakta, both, everywhere. And in Srimad Bhagavatam has been written, without the process, following the process of bhakti, anyone cannot be happy in their life. This bhakti has been divided by Sanatana Goswami three classes, three stages. 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 Jnani Bhakta, Shuddha Bhakta, Premi Bhakta, Prem Par Bhakta, Premati Gopis are yet beyond this limit. Who are Jnani Bhakta? Pradhan Maharaj. Jnani Nirvishesh Bhadi. And tattva jnani are different. Here tattva jnani. Pradhan Maharaj in whole world he see Krishna. And in Krishna whole world. He samatars. All good qualities in him. So, in Srimad Bhagavatam, Pradhan Maharaj Upadkhyan is told. If anyone wants to begin bhakti, he must follow Prahlad And second, Ambarish Maharaj Suddha Bhakta. We will explain. Third, Premi Bhakta Hanuman. <coughs> Prempar Bhakta Pandavas. And Primatu Uddha. One thing also, mixture of bhakti and karma, mixture of bhakti and gyan, mixture of bhakti and yoga, they are not pure bhakti. Among them, karma vishya bhakta is dhruva. He will explain about dhruva. We should try to Think why Dhruva is not told Shuddha pure Bhakta. If you have any worldly desire, desire of heaven, Mukti, then you are not pure Bhakta. Krishna cannot be happy like that. In brief. Om again, Nirandasya, Kanam Jana Savakaya. Chakshivanda Vitandi, that was my Sri Guru.
I offer my most humble obeisances unto the lotus feet of my Diksha Guru. Paramaradya Param Pujapal Sisi Nadi Si Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada. And then again, unto the lotus feet of my Shiksha Guru and Sanyas Guru, Sisi Mad Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the Tree Dandi Sanyasi Khan, unto all of the Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis, Anula Pranam. So, <clears throat> Dhruva Maharaj's story in the fourth canto, eighth chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam, Dhruva is the son of Uttanapada and grandson of Swayambhu Manu and great grandson of Lord Brahma. King Uttanapada had two wives, Suniti and Suruchi. Of the two, Suruchi was his favorite. He had more affection for her. And she had one son, Uttam. So one day in the court, while King Uttanapada was sitting there on the throne, Uttam and Dhruv were trying to sit up in the lap of King Uttanapada. And Suruchi was looking on at the scene. And Uttam got up on his lap, and Dhruv was trying to get there, but he was not being given much assistance by the king and could not reach. Then Suruchi began to speak very harsh words to him. That you cannot sit on the lap of the king because you have not been born from my womb. And if you want to sit on the lap of the king, you will have to perform tapasya, austerities, to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and then take birth again and come from my womb. Then you can sit on the lap of your father and on the throne. So like this, she spoke in a very harsh and mean way, but she also gave some very good instruction. When Drew heard these statements, he was, it said, it described that he was felt like he was a snake who had been hit by a stick. And he began to sigh very heavily. He ran to his mother with tears in his eyes, and his mother Suniti, hearing from all of the court people could understand what it, all the words that had been said by Suruchi, and she was very upset as well. But she never said anything to condemn Suruchi. In fact, she told Dhruva, do not have any anger or wish any ill to Suruchi or any other person because it will come back to you. And you should take that the teachings that Suruchi has given are very valuable, that you should worship the Supreme Personality of God and to get whatever it is that you want. She has described correctly that I am not even considered a maidservant of your father and I am a lowly person. So she saw, explained like this, there is no good qualities in me and there are so many good qualities in her. So in this way, she had the vision of a Vaishnavi and instructed her son that if you worship the Supreme Personality of God and then you will get what you want. Even if you have desires, as it is stated in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Kamo Sarva Kamo Va, Moksha Kama Udaladi, Tivrena Bhakti Yogena, Yajeta Purushamba. So, in this way, she instructed him even though you have a material desire, you should understand that the goddess of fortune, even when your grandfather, Lord, great grandfather, Lord Brahma, wants the favor of the goddess of fortune, he cannot get it because she is always engaged in the service of Vishnu. So, if you want the favor of the goddess of fortune to get this kingdom greater than your father, greater than your grandfather, you will have to worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, in this way, Immediately, taking the instructions of his mother to worship the Supreme Lord, he left the palace, gave up everything, and went to the forest. It is stated here that uh, Narada Muni overheard the conversation. And this is the power of such great pure devotees. Just as in the last uh, story that was being explained by Padmanabha Maharaj, that we see that Narada Muni, he can hear and understand these things even from a great distance. Just as it's explained in the 11th canto that all the mystic potencies uh, that are given to mystic yogis, being able to enter into the ether and hear the conversations of people everywhere, being able to enter into people's minds and understand their thoughts, 
If a common mystic yogi can have these, they become the maid servants of a pure devotee, and a pure devotee like Narada or anyone in our disciplic succession can antachara, enter into the chambers of the heart and understand the desires of the living entity. So overhearing this conversation, just like the super soul, Narada Muni came to try and give some valuable instruction to Dhruva and give him some direction. When Narada Muni came there, at first, he tested Dhruva. And he tried to dissuade him. You are a young boy. You are supposed to be playing now. You are supposed to be having fun. You are not fit to stay in the forest. You are not capable of doing this. These austerities are very severe. You should not be doing like this. Wait till you grow older. Wait till you've had some life, some experience. You have done things, huh? Dharma, Artha, Kama, do all this first, then look for these other things. But after Dhruva heard all these instructions from Narada, he told, no, I cannot accept your words. Because of my anger, because of my ignorance, I cannot accept your valuable instructions. I want Krishna now. I want my kingdom now. So, seeing the determination of Dhruva, Narada took mercy upon him. And he began to instruct him in the process of devotional service. And he gave him all shiksha and diksha. He gave him instructions about how to perform puja, where to perform puja, how to perform meditation, how to, and he also gave him the diksha mantra. He gave him a complete description of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, how he should meditate on the Lord from the lotus feet to the smiling face. And by giving him the diksha mantra, he initiated him into the sampradaya. So after giving him shiksha and diksha, all information, abhideya, prayoja, all information was given, then he instructed him that you must go to Madhuvan forest and perform your worship there, and then you will get everything that you want. So, Dhruva Maharaj immediately accepted all of the instructions of Narada Muni to do the worship. He immediately went to Madhavan Forest. He immediately started performing the worship as it was instructed by Narada Muni. He immediately began the meditation and the practices of bhakti as it was described by Narada Muni. Therefore, Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says in the purport, that this was the success of Dhruva Maharaj, that he completely accepted the orders of the Guru. He was completely anugatya. Whatever the Guru instructed, he did without fail, without deviation, without change. This became his saving grace. Didn't matter how much tapasya or austerity he performed. What actually was the real medicine that gave him the benediction of Krishna's darshan and Krishna's mercy was that he followed the orders of the Guru. So in the first month when he was there in Madhavan, he only ate fruits and berries every three days. In the second month, then he ate fruit, dry grass and leaves every six days. In the third month, he drank some water every nine days. In the fourth month, he breathed air once every 12 days. In the fifth month, he achieved such a perfection of steadiness of mind and breath that he was able to perform the austerity of standing on one foot. He placed the one foot like this and then standing like this and he began his meditation in this position. And then in the sixth month, he became so perfect at controlling his breath that he was able to see and controlling his mind and controlling everything, he was able to see the Supreme Personality of Godhead within his heart. Then, becoming one with the Supreme Personality of Godhead became as heavy as Vishnu. Becoming as heavy as Vishnu and controlling his breath in this way and not even breathing, he started to choke up the breath of the entire universe. By moving his toe, he was able to push down the weight of the earth. So powerful because he had become one in harmony with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Lord of the Three Worlds. At that point when he was choking up the breathing of the entire universe, the demigods all pleaded with Lord Vishnu that you please resolve this issue. Why none of us can breathe? At that time Vishnu said, don't worry, this young boy, he has done very severe tapasya for me, I'm going to be, deal with it now. Then. Vishnu descended on the bird carrier Varuda. He appeared there before 
Dhruva Maharaj, and Dhruva Maharaj did not see him. He was looking at Krishna within his heart, meditating on the form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He was in complete unison with Krishna, and then suddenly the form disappeared. Then he snapped out of his meditation and opened his eyes, and there the Supreme Personality of Godhead was standing before him. In great ecstasy, he fell like a stick, boom, falling at the feet of the Supreme Lord, grabbing the feet of the Lord and kissing them and embracing them with his arms and weeping and washing them with his tears. He exhibited all of the different ecstatic symptoms of love of God. And then he wanted to make prayers to the Supreme Lord and he stood there trembling with folded hands, but he could not express himself. Then Vishnu took the conch shell and touching his forehead, enlightened him completely in all Vedic knowledge and he began to recite so many beautiful prayers in glorification of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. At that point, he also expressed at the end of his prayers his great lamentation. That, in worshiping you, I was looking for some broken pieces of glass. And, and I overlooked the transcendental divine gem of your beautiful lotus feet. He said, so I am lamenting so much now. You have benedicted me. You have offered me this benediction. And now you are going to give me a planet. You're going to give me a kingdom greater even than my father, grand, great grandfather, Lord Brahma. You're going to give me this pole star, which is above the Saptarishi, the seven planets of the Saptarishis. It is so high that in the uh, temporary devastation of the universe, this does not become devastating that this planet remains eternal. In fact, it is the planet that you reside on in the ocean of milk. And in fact, no one has ever been the presiding king of that planet. And you have given me this, but now I will have to stay here for thousands and thousands of years. And I am lamenting, I am lamenting my sad condition that because I worship you with some desires, sakam, that now I am still stuck here in this material world and I, get, I have not been able to be able to engage in your devotional service purely. So he lamented like this. Therefore, one has to be very careful when they practice devotional service not to have any desires, no karma, no jnana, no yoga, nothing. As that verse was explained by Gurdjanam Prabhu, uh, that uh, anyabhilashita shunya, the boy of karma, jnana, karma, Jnana Karma Adi Anavritam, Jnana Karma Adi, Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, and Astanga Yoga or Mystic Yoga. All of these things must be gone, shunya, devoid. If you want pure bhakti, then you have to cultivate it. Anushilanam, uh, it must be consistently and constantly cultivated under anu, anu means anugatya, under the guidance of the sadhu, the pure devotee who gives the instructions, the shiksha and the diksha, and following those instructions and purely executing devotional service, one can become completely relieved of all material contaminations and attain the highest goal, the highest platform of Goloka Vrindavan and Brajrasi praying. So in the end, of course, after 30, 36,000 years of managing his uh, father's kingdom, then he entered onto the airplane, the great air. He went, he left his kingdom. He went to Badridashram, there meditating. The airplane came from Vaikuntha to take him back to the spiritual world. After circumambulating the airplane and then stepping on the head of death, he marched into the airplane. But then still something was there. He told, oh, my mother, where is my mother? <laughs> Because she had given him the shiksha, the initial shiksha that he should worship the Supreme Personality of God. In. But that was all being arranged. Another plane was taking his mother. So he attained by Kunta, but as Shula Gurdjieff points out, some sakam, there was with some material desires. He performed bhakti, and eventually he became a pure bhakta, but there were some material motivations behind it. If one wants to attain 
the pure bhakti of going to the supreme personality of God in Krishna and Goloka, he must get beyond this kind of practice of devotional service and practice according to the descriptions given by Srila Rupa Goswami, Anya Vilashi Tashunyam, Gana Karmadi Anavritam, Anupuyena Shiranaka Shiranam, Tapakti Rutma. In this Annabilasita Shlok, it has not been told Gyan Karma Shunya, only cover. Without karma, you cannot survive. Survive your life. Without knowledge, you cannot. <clears throat> so, two are essential for our life. But it shouldn't be covered. It is covered by karma, which are not favorable for bhakti. Those one who are favorable for bhakti, they are not important, not sunna. And in this way, gyan also, knowledge is also. Krishna Prattva, gyan is knowledge. It must be. But gyan, nirvishesh gyan, maya bhat or dvait bhat, Krishna has no form, God has no form, Brahma has no form, no quality, nothing. This is nirata, niranya. So, <clears throat> after Dhruva comes the stage of Jnani Bhakta. Prahlad Maharaj is Jnani Bhakta. So, you should describe him very briefly. Guruve Gaur Chandra Radhikaya Tadale Krishna Krishna Vakta Tadavakta Namo First of all, I give pranams to Sri Gurudev, Om Vishnu Bhat, Sisamad Bhat, Vedam Narayan, Narasai Maharaj, Trinadi Sanyasis, Brahmacharis, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Gurudev has ordered me to speak, try to speak something about the glories of Sri Prahlad Maharaj. Sri Prahlad Maharaj is called Gyani Bhakta. <coughs> Actually, Dhruva, he is not counted amongst these five because he worshipped the Lord with material desires. Therefore, Guru Dev said, Dhruva Charitra, he is one example of how not to perform bhakti. Because actually, Dhruva could not make his heart one with the instructions of Narad Muni at all. Narad Muni instructed him, you should give up desires for honour and dishonour and just be situated happily. But Dhruva said, I cannot, I am Chatriya, I cannot give up my nature. Devil, please give me some instructions how I can achieve my goal in some honest means. Therefore, Dhruva, he kept some difference between himself and his Guru Dev. But Prahlad Maharaj was completely different than this. He had no even touch of material desire. Therefore, he is called Gyani Bhakta. Gyani Bhakta means he has knowledge that Krishna is the Supreme Lord. Therefore, he worships him with so much or in reverence. There is a difference between Jnani and Jnani Bhakta, as Sri Guru Dev said. Jnanis do not accept the eternal form of the Lord or the position as the Jiva as Bhagavan's eternal servant. But Jnani Bhaktas, like Prahlad, like Grandfather Bhishma, they are devotees. They have no tinge of material desire. Therefore, it's a very great history in the seventh canto. Prahlad, he took birth as the son of the great demon Hiranyakasipu. There were sometimes like even gold may appear in a dirty place. Sometimes Vaishnavas may appear in any dynasty for the purification of that dynasty. Like Hanuman, he appeared in Mangi dynasty. Or like demons like Bali Maharaj, they also appeared like that. Or amongst the bird species, Garuda. There were even though Prahlad Maharaj appeared in the family of demons, actually he was pure Vaishnava. So, his father was very much antagonistic towards the Lord 